our speaker today is Dr. Francisco Bracho. He's our pediatric hematologist oncologist. Been with us about a decade. Yep. Yeah. Um, and has been a great resource for you know myself and our and definitely for our patients in the county. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about anemia. All right. So thank you for for coming. It's a uh... It's actually a, a little more general talk than specifically a pediatric talk, just as it ended up. Um, and part of that comes um, out of the fact that there's an effort to limit the amount of transfusions. Uh, and blood obviously has been something that uh, we have worked with for a long time. Frankly, you know, as a hematologist, I kind of find it as one of the foundations of modern medicine. But even before modern medicine, you know, blood was very important. Although at that time, it was mostly bleeding. Mm -hmm. And our very prestigious journal, The Lancet, is not, you know, is referring to bleeding people. Um, and that was a very popular practice on how to manage blood. And now it's very popular to transfuse blood. But how did we get from there to here, right? Um, it's actually not even that long ago. That, uh, for us to get from bleeding people to actually having a, system, a systematic way of transfusing people. In the past, it was person to person. This was a surgical event that only a few surgeons uh, could accomplish. And this is turn of last century, 1905. And that was the first time they could, say, they could actually transfuse people and actually saved quite a few people, although they didn't do it all that well. They didn't cross match. Um, many of the donors were whoever they could conscript from the streets. Um, but cross-matching obviously was one of the big important things and Carl Landsteiner is uh, definitely the father of this. He's the one that de determined the ABO types and then later on RH and many other uh, antigens as well. So we all uh, kind of know the Punnett square version of who's compatible with who, but I actually prefer this one that show you have the universal donor at the top, the universal recipient on the bottom, and then all arrows point down. It's, a little, it's actually a little easier, although this is kind of ingrained in, in all of this, but it becomes important because later on I'm gonna talk about plasma for the same thing. The other great advance in, in being able to transfuse people was being able to store blood. Instead of it having to be person to person, if you could store blood, that was then you could transfuse it later in the future. And sodium citrate was the first great anticoagulant. There was many, many attempts to try and figure out what would be an anticoagulant. Popular use of, of blood, well, not popular use, but the first systematic use of blood was actually during the, the Spanish Civil War. And both uh, Norman Bethune and Duran Jordan were instrumental in, in developing a, a delivery system. Here you can see Bethune with a unit of blood and transfuse it. This was because you wouldn't ha necessarily have someone that could transfuse you on the field and to get them, the soldier from the field to the hospital, well, chances are they wouldn't make it. So he had his van and they'd go out to the field and transfuse blood. Jorda was the one that got donors and so he was actually the one that was more, much more meticulous than Bethune, which was, you know, uh, a cowboy of a, of a doctor. Um, and Jordan would, you know, interview people. He would do a syphilis test on the donors, and uh, that way he would have a much more safe and secure you know, blood banking system. This, uh, uh, for many things, the Spanish Civil War was a prelude to World War II, and that's when blood became in, into great use. The program blood plasma for Britain that was uh, part of the uh, um, Red Cross was the first major uh, adventure to get many, many donors. And it says plasma because originally Charles Drew and Alex Carell uh, decided that, well, instead of having to cross match everyone, if we just give plasma, you don't have to worry about that pesky cross matching and we could just give plasma. And they even had developed a, a dried plasma to try, to try to be able to transport overseas. Plasma also kept a little better than blood. Um, it didn't, that original plan, blood, blood plasma for Britain, but when it was actually the US involved, 
it was the blood that was that was sent because in truth that's what they needed not just plasma they needed oxygen carrying capacity and you would think well after this the enormous success of, of that event adventure that uh, blood banking would have been uh, a routine thing and it wasn't actually the american red cross started closing down donor centers and it wasn't until a, a new group of people started to revive it that it became uh, the staple that it is today. The other thing that we already no notice is that whole blood is not what we're talking about. We're talking about fractions of blood. And early on, there was, very, there was a whole set of experiments on fractionating blood. Right now, these are the standard uh, fractions of, of blood. So here's whole blood. That's not available. Um, a, a unit of blood, of packed red blood cells, that's about 325 ml. Uh, and then plasma, which is another 300, well, that actually adds, adds up to more than the pint that's in here, but that's because of sodium citrate, right? The anticoagulant in, in this original bag makes the volume um, larger. Here are platelets, and this is cryoprecipitate. And this is my initial summary slide because, you know, someone's going to take a nap before the end. So you can see, well, how much do you trans transfuse, right? Well, so it's important to know what the volume of, of your unit is. And you're not going to know when you order it from the blood bank. So you have to take a good guess and see if it's reasonable. But it's important to know that four mil per kg will give you one gram higher in, in red cells. Um, plasma is about 10 mil per kg. It's almost not always, but that's generally speaking the way it is. And platelets are 350, although they can be quite a big bag. And in our system, they're all phoresis platelets, so it'd be one phoresis unit, and it's given by gravity. Uh, cryoprecipitate, one unit is typically five bags of cryoprecipitate, and that's what it is in our system. And so then for an adult, it'd be one to two um, units. All right, but why is there this campaign to limit blood transfusion? Well, blood transfusion is the most common procedure in the hospital. So something that needs, and we think we all know how it happens, and, but it's enough that even with a small complication rate, you have serious problems that can happen for, for patients. And because it's been around for so long, we've kind of uh, fallen on old habits. And, and instead, what we need is, as best we can, evidence-based medicine. So transfusion-related uh, acute lung injury is about two in 10,000 units uh, transfused. Transfusion-associated circulatory overload, that's a variable amount. Obviously, it depends how sickly the patients are. So in the ICU, that's 6% of patients. Um, and then that same study, out of it's, uh, quite, it's a, another percent of platelet transfusions. A hemolytic reaction, right? So that can happen with incompatible plasma. It can happen with, with, with red cells. And that's why we're so particular about how blood is transfused, why it always has to be double checked, because you do not want to have an incompatible hemolytic reaction. If you transfuse people, you will develop alloimmunization. They can develop antibodies against those red cells, and that can be a bad outcome. Um, that was the bad outcome for RH disease that we didn't understand until the 40s and 50s, actually the 50s is when we um, actually started solving that. And we think that giving blood makes people better off, but, in, but many studies show that uh, surgical patients, other patients have a worse outcome if they were transfused, right? And, if, and, that's for, and this particular one is adults that had cardiac surgery. And it's not just immediately that they have a, a bad outcome in the hospital, but even late afterward, it persists. And this is, you know, with the populations being equal. This is our statistics, how much transfusions happen um, in our hospital. So this is three years. So we've seen already that there is a, a, a change. So this is interesting, actually, that maybe some of the, uh, these ideas have already come across, but it is, a, you see, more than 2,000 red cell transfusions. Um, and then platelets, is more variable. Um, and here we have about 800 plasma transfusions. So it's a very, very, right, very, very common event. It's gonna, it's altogether, it's gonna be, you know, close to 4,000 procedures in a hospital 
for one particular uh, event. Um, and then I, I just decided to show what's currently, um, and then this is across blood types. So, and I'll just highlight one thing, and that is here's FFP, AB positive for this quarter is, um, for last year, is the most common type of transfused plasma, right? Um, whereas, you know, red cells is O, O positive and O negative, and FFP, it's almost reversed. Not if we look back, there, um, O ends up being close to the AB positive, but that's still a, um, a dramatic uh, event. All right, so now let's talk about these fractions in a little more detail. On how to, so here's a, a whole blood unit and then it's attached to the units, the, the fractions that we're gonna get. You spin it and then you get a layer and then you just squeeze it. And that's how you get packed cells and plasma, right? So, then where, so where do platelets come from? Platelets come two ways. You spin it again and then you'll get a little pellet of platelets at the bottom and squeeze it again. And so now you have your plasma here and your platelets in there. So that's the platelets from one unit of blood. Our hospital doesn't carry those. Instead, we use, um, oh, okay, here's the last fraction. Um, let's go back a little bit. So plasma is routinely frozen um, and it's frozen while it's fresh. That's why it's called fresh frozen. And why is that? Because the coagulation factors will deteriorate rapidly in, the, in, in, in unfrozen plasma. So it'll be less effective as time goes on. And once it's frozen, then it's effective for a long time, a year. But in a few weeks, you'll have less factor seven, you'll have less factor two in, um, in plasma. So that's why it's routinely frozen. If you thaw it, but not only up to four degrees, then there's a little bit that doesn't get thawed, and that's cryoprecipitate. So you take your already frozen plasma, you decide you're, you thaw some of it, and then you squeeze off the, the supernatant again, and that's the precipitate from the previously frozen uh, plasma. So, and, and in all of these, you can see it's a small volume, right? As you can imagine, right? This is a piece of a piece of a piece. Um, it has specifically a lot of fibrinogen, but also has one lower factor in factor eight. Originally, this was what was used for hemophilia treatment. And in many blood banks, it's still called AHF, anti-hemophilic factor. But platelets, are typically collected by phoresis. And phoresis is a, used um, what was prevalent in the milk industry to get heavy and light cream. You get two bowls and you spin them. You can separate the heavier component of the liquid from the lighter component of the liquid and have heavy cream and light cream. So if you put blood in the system, you can separate red cells, platelets, plasma, white cells, however you want, depending on where you you set the gradient. And that's what's inside here, inside a phoresis machine. And then you'll have all the connections so that you put whichever fraction you want to, to save and whatever fraction you want to give back to the patient. And that's a, a phoresis. Typically, for platelet collection, they'll do two blood volumes. So the total blood volume of a patient, of a donor, times two. So they'll calculate that based off of their height and weight. They'll hook them up and, then, and they'll bleed them, collect it, and re, uh, and re auto transfuse simultaneously. And that's how phoresis works. All right, the special requirements, right? Blood, um, we see these in our, in our orders, and then we usually ask the hematologist, what do they all mean? Um, and we'll get rid of the first one sickle negative. So if a patient has sickle cell disease, and they're, you're giving them a transfusion, you don't want to give them more sickle cell. So you want to check that the donor is, does not have sickle cell trait. Otherwise, if you do not have sickle cell disease, you can receive a unit that has um, sickle cell trait. 
And this is done by um, hydrogen sulfide re reduction and um, making a lot of deoxygenated hemoglobin S and looking for uh, agglutination. Leukin reduction. Leukin reduction used to be only at bedside. So they would you put a filter on the unit of blood that would uh, remove uh, white blood cells, or the nurse would. And then sometimes in some places, the, the blood bank would do it, look filter it, and then deliver it. Now it's done in the blood collection system. So United Blood Services, American Red Cross, they will do the loop reduction. So all, all blood is universally loop reduced. Why? Okay. Well, white blood cells are the ones that carry the biggest risk of fever. Uh, so they're the biggest source, we, we thought, of the transfusion reactions that happen when you transfuse red cells, was contaminating white blood cells. So if you remove that, the process is easier. They also harbor cytomegalovirus. And if you remove them, then you can remove the, the, the possibility of transmitting cytomegalovirus. Well, filtration is never complete. You can't be sure that you got rid of every single one, it's just, but did you get rid of enough? All right. And as I mentioned, it's used to, it's now standard. CMV, C are negative. So they test the donor. Did the, do they have a CMV antibody or not? Um, if you don't have a CMV antibody, then you weren't exposed to CMV, and therefore you couldn't transmit CMV. And that's what we would we did before universal leukemia reduction to limit the transmission of CMV to immune incompetent patients. It's typically considered redundant now that there's universal leukemia reduction. So there's still a few patients that uh, they're, they're, they may want to, but in many places it would still be the scenario that if it's leukemia reduced, it's fine. Um, neonates, which are immune incompetent, solid organ transplant patients, some services will still ask you, please give us CMV negative blood. Irradiation. Irradiation damages DNA. Its goal is to dam damage the DNA of lymphocytes so that those cells can't divide. Neutrophils don't divide ever again. They're already uh, mature. They don't have any possibility um, of dividing. So therefore, the lymphocytes that are transfusing to the patient can't expand, causing graft versus host disease. This was actually one of the, the dis discovered in neonates uh, originally that they would get skin rash, diarrhea, hyperbilirubinemia, graft-versus-host disease related to a, a, a transfusion. And irradiation doesn't kill the lymphocytes, but doesn't allow them to divide, so you can't have this total expansion. Um, so irradiation is used in pediatric patients that are receiving chemotherapy, uh, hematologic malignancies, neonates, directed donor, because you have the fact that you have more matches in relatives, the chance of GVHD is higher, because you're partially HLA matched, le leading to some co-stimulatory molecules, or if you have a congenital immune deficiency. It, for an acquired immune deficiency, it depends. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, the, the last thing that we'll talk about is uh, time. Um, for neonates, it used to be the story that we would do designated donor. One unit for the lifespan of that unit would be transfused to that baby. So that baby would only receive from one original donor, limiting the amount of sensitization that, that, that could happen. But that meant that you had a very old unit by the time the baby was finished being transfused. And they thought, well, maybe that's a problem, having old blood around that's had uh, more chance to have uh, toxins build up. So instead, let's limit the number of days, seven days, 10 days, that you would use a unit to transfuse a baby. And this is a controversial um, event, right? Uh, so they've gone back and forth. Originally, everyone was designated donor, and then it was all fresh. And now people are saying, well, fresh may not be important. Um, but that's something that in the NICU will, um, will come up. And that's um, an ongoing uh, issue. All right. Now we'll talk about it. So we talked to, I'm going to talk about each of the other units, and then we'll talk about blood, right? Because blood, the packed red blood cells. So plasma. Plasma, the reason you transfuse plasma is for coagulation factors. Coagulation factors are just a unit per mil, right? One unit is 1%, and that's just the way it is. Except for factor eight, and that's just an accident of history, and it's one unit, it's, uh, it's two units for one. So 
to stop people from bleeding, you don't need to get them to 100% for most things, just to 10%. So if you give them 10% of their plasma volume, it should be okay. But plasma is probably um, only 50% of the factors involved. So you do a little bit of math and you say, well, probably you'll need around 500, 600 mils to stop someone um, from bleeding, to get up to 10%. And in children, it would be about 10 mil per kg, right? So remembering that a, a unit is about 300, for adults, it, to do anything, you're probably going to need to give them two units. And in children, you can work your way up, but start 10 mil per kg, and then you'd have to check, see, if, well, did you get to the, the coagulation parameters you, you were looking for? Platelets, so uh, thoresis platelets have about 300 billion Platelets, that will raise your platelet count about 30 to 50. It's variable. Um, a single donor platelet, the one that's just connected from one unit, is about uh, 50 billion. So six single donors is the same as one platelet phoresis donor, right? So that means it, it would also it, it would get you up not that much, about 10 for each one single donor unit. Uh, we don't have single donor units here. I'm, I think they are uh, available. It would only be in a, in a strange circumstance that we'd actually re request it. But platelets are kept warm and have a, um, so they have a shorter shelf life because of that and also because they'll eventually agglutinate. Meaning that the risk of bacterial contamination with platelets is higher than with red cells. Um, and they're, so, a transfusion-related bacterial infection is another, another complication from platelet transfusion. All right, now compatibility. We talked, you know, this is now kind of the more the Punnett square version of it, right, where you have antigens, so, so A on um, type A blood, and you have antibodies, but they're the opposite, right? B antibodies in A blood, the AB, they don't have either of the antibodies, and the O's have both. They have antibodies against the B, and they have antibodies against the A, which makes compatibility the opposite. No antibodies at all, so you could give that to anybody, and O can receive from anybody. So now our universal donor and our universal recipient are flipped in this uh, version of it because there are no antibodies to react against the red blood cells. So for both plasma and platelets, right? Because if you, with the squeeze platelets, that's still in plasma. And with the phoresis, they're still suspended in, in plasma. So it's mostly platelets, but also plasma. So there's still gonna be antibodies uh, involved. However, antibody, is not as big a deal as red cell antigens. If you have red cell antigens, you're going to have hemolysis. Here, well, this is 10% of their blood volume. The amount of antibody that you're going to trans, uh, transfuse in the patient is small. So the actual risk of hemolysis is small. So you can give incompatible plasma and platelets to a patient, but it's a risk. So it's up to you to know which ones are compatible when you order a transfusion? Because blood bank's gonna ask you, do you want to give anything or compatible? And the biggest issue isn't with plasma, it's with platelets, right? Platelets have a short half-life, they're difficult to collect. So they're the ones that the chance that you have every type of platelet available is low. So you're gonna ask them, well, am I gonna give a compatible platelet? Well, you should try, right? Or am I gonna give an incompatible platelet? All right, and as I mentioned, triprecipitate um, was used several decades ago as anti-hemophilic factor. Today it's used as fibrinogen re replacement, usually for a fibrinogen less than 100. Um, it's a, one single unit, right? One bag for every five kilograms of weight, right? Because five kilograms of weight would actually end up you having about a pint of blood. So it's the replacement of your one pint. Um, and then when they pull them, it'll be five units 
There is a slight ordering issue in our system in that there are both things are called units, right? The single unit and the pulled unit aren't separated. So it is important that you that you speak directly with the, the nurse and the blood bank about what it is that you need, right? In, in pediatrics, they say with a little kid, I want two single units. As an adult, I want two whole units, right? In general, you know, except when you, you know, for a typical child, a school age child, you wouldn't go up to more than one pool. So you wouldn't go up to more than five. So five kilos, five per kilo up to 25 kilo. And an adult, you'd go, you start off with two, and then you could check the fibrinogen level afterwards. There is very little antibodies in this, right? This is that pellet. So the type of the cryoprecipitate is unimportant for the transfusion. All right, now red cells, right? This is, a, we talked about this map before, but this is now the actual detail. Uh, so one unit, 325, it might, it might be up to 400, it might be smaller. The hematocrit is typically about 60%. So even though it's concentrated, it's also um, reconstituted in, in citrate. And four mils per kg will give you up about a gram, All right? And then how much, so time, so four hours. This is, you know, you can't give blood over, over more than four hours. And why is that? Because it's considered contaminated. It has now been warm for too long and therefore can have bacteria. It isn't because it's a safe thing to transfuse it over four hours or not. It's that it's unsafe to transfuse it once it's been out of storage for more than four hours. So the better way to write transfusion is by rate, like we write everything else. Unfortunately, that's not available in the adult. It is available in pediatrics though. So good on your pediatrician. Um, and then, well, what rate do you pick? Well, that's how much volume the patient can tolerate. So if your patient has bad kidneys, a bad heart, they can handle a, a less of a rate. If they don't, they can handle the volume, then you pick a, a rate that's appropriate for that. We do have a standard in the hospital so that you know most people won't get it wrong, and that's either two to five mil per kg per hour in children, right? The two actually, given the, Raising someone one gram isn't hardly ever a goal, right? You want to raise someone that probably, if you're transfusing them, you want to get them back out to a, a safe number. And therefore, well, it's probably going to be two grams or a little bit more than that. So, and typically for children, it'll be 10. Why? Because 10 is an easy number to remember. And it'll get you up two and a half grams. That's going to get you out of tr trouble in, in, in most situations that you're transfusing for. And if you do that at two mil um, per kg per hour, well, that's going to get you to four hours. So. Um, I'll, so that's why the bottom number is two and the top number is five because that's generally speaking an average, you know, transfusion rate, but you can pick whatever is safe for the patient. Policy does specify uh, that should be uh, considered. Obviously, if they're bleeding, you're going to give it as they need it. All right. So now limiting transfusions. These are... Uh, the American Board of Internal Medicine has a, a program called Choosing Wisely to try and limit unnecessary procedures, right? And these societies have all decided that one of the things that is um, unnecessary, overused is transfusion. And so all of them have put recommendations to try and limit the amount of transfusion that they give. Uh, you'll notice that the American Academy of Pediatrics is not on here because that's not one of their most overused uh, policies. Neither the American Association uh, of Family Practice Physicians, right? But um, the one I actually like the best is, is the hospital medicine. Avoid transfusions for an arbitrary hemoglobin. Instead, do it for symptoms, all right? And then if they have some other complicating factor, all right? And then just uh, a couple other things that most of them specifically exclude. Well, if they have blood loss, well, then the, once again, the hemoglobin doesn't matter. You don't need to correct for that. And so, um, and then the obstetrics uh, says, you know, unless um, they're symptomatic, we should try for, for seven. Anesthesia six, 
critical care, seven. Now, where do these numbers come from? Well, frankly, this is a, a drive down from 10, which was the standard before, because 10 is anemic. So if you're 10, you should get transfused. But when they actually, way at the beginning, when they were doing transfusion uh, experiments, a hemoglobin of three or four is actually when you start running into trouble. So even all of these are significantly above that. Okay, well, we don't want to get to the point where you have limited oxygen carrying capacity because of your hemoglobin. Um, and this is our first uh, attempt to drive down, our second attempt to drive down. So we went from 10 down to eight, and now we're going from eight down to seven. So, but as I mentioned, the hemoglobin is arbitrary, right? It's what are you trying to fix it and correct? The American Association of Blood Banks, of course, all of their things are gonna be about blood, right? What are the overseeing, overused things for blood? And, and here's the long list, they're all important. I'm just gonna rewrite them all though. So because this is how I read it. So you should transfuse only one unit at a time and measure your result, right? In the patient that's not bleeding, et cetera. Well, what's the measuring the result? Well, that's symptomatic for improvement, right? What were you trying to fix? And their hemoglobin result, right? And that tells you, well, how, how accurate were you with your original calculation, right? Oh, I'm, you know, that one unit is gonna probably raise me just a gram. That's probably not gonna be enough. I'm probably gonna need another. All right, you do that. Or I transfuse 300 mil in this baby, um, in this uh, school age kid, it should get up to a, about nine and a half. And it only got up to eight. Well. So where is my other thing? You should only check CBCs because you're gonna do something about it. So don't, don't phlebotomize your patients. That's what, the, that's what they were trying to get at. But you shouldn't just routinely check and check and check. This is definitely an, an adult uh, uh, thing to talk about. But if you're measuring their INR and it's an outpatient, you should manage them as an outpatient. You shouldn't plan on transfusing them because of their INR. And if the reason they're anemic is because they're low in iron, well then give them iron, don't give them blood. So those are all of these, just in my language, all right? Um, now I'll talk a little bit about emergency transfusion, right? When you don't have an available cross match. So it's gonna be unmatched blood, right? And we know, okay, if it's unmatched, well, you're gonna give universal donor, you're gonna give O negative, right? Well, as I mentioned, negative is only since the 50s. So um, RH or uh, D is uh, a problem for women because it will sensitize them for the next pregnancy and cause hydroxytalis. But there's no naturally occurring antibody against RH. So those are the isohemoglutinins. So if you transfuse someone that's RH negative with RH positive, they won't hemolyze that blood today. They'll have troubles later, right? Um, so originally O negative um, was the goal, but now they're saying for adult males, O positive is fine, right? And if you look at VCMC, um, the ratio between um, positive and negative transfusion, so A is a five to one, but O is two to one, right? So that's saying we give a lot more O negative blood than what's probably in the population. This is not specifically VCMCs, this is just generally speaking, right? O negative is 7% of the population, O positive is 38%. And if you only use, if you use O negative on every unmatched, um, you're gonna run out of O negative. And definitely we're at risk of that. So recently, this has changed. And except for women and children, a O positive will be the, the, the the unmatched blood that's that's given. So women of childbearing potential, they'll receive O negative. All right. Um, infants are at a high risk from uh, com from complications, and they may have underlying hemolysis as an issue. So O negative is a commonly used event in them. Um, and then at BCMC, other children, so not infants, right? Not 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 neonates are excluded because they're going to have a long life living with, and they may need other transfusions. And that's actually just a VCUMC choice, not from American Association of Blood Bank. So an adult male uh, having uh, emergency blood loss, needing emergency replacement, will have O positive received. 
And this is a, something the blood bank has to work carefully on, make sure they, they're delivering the right thing to the right patient. And at the bedside as well, uh, typically in the ER, but could also possibly happen um, in, in the ICU. All right. Um, so this is uh, from um, 1908, um, but it's actually uh, a review of some things that happened in the 60s. So a virginal young woman is brought to the attention uh, for palpitations of the heart, somnolence, a sense of discomfort, a disclination for work. She has a languid physiognomy, a uh, heavy walk, and is pale with the waxen color of the gums and inner eyelids. This diagnosis in the 1500s and the 1800s was chlorosis, a sickly green. Yes. All right. So what's the cause of chlorosis? Well, at the time, right, all the maybe it was amenorrhea. So, what, uh, so then they have too much blood in their body and you just need to bleed them again, right? Oh no, it's because they, they're too chaste, right? They haven't chosen to, got, to get married. So that's easy. Get them married, let them have sex, and that'll fix them right away. Um, and then, of course, you know, so the, uh, thank you. Damage from uh, their corsets. This was uh, at, at least the, the more progressive version of it. Uh, but some people just realize, oh yes, this is a problem of uh, food and diet. And then if we add actually sh uh, steel filings to their food, they'll be, they'll be better off. This is of course my introduction to iron deficiency because young women with uh, have um, many reasons to have uh, iron deficiency anemia. But the other patients that we all commonly see with iron deficiency are patients that are exclusively breastfed beyond four months. So after four months, you have to have something else, either iron or iron-containing cereal. Um, delayed weaning, so still not on solid foods and they're 12 months uh, of age, or excessive milk intake. Patients that have any type of gastritis, esophageal varices, and then menorrhagia, menorrhagia, uh, or dietary. They're choosing not to have iron in their diet. They're vegetarian. Um, they're exclusive bariatric procedures. And of course, if they have blood loss from bowel disease, all of these can lead. What should you do for these patients? Well, you should give them iron. Right? And I'm a big proponent of IV iron if you really are worried about the patient saying, well, I need to get their hemoglobin up there. Hemoglobin is six, right? That's below seven. Shouldn't I transfuse them? No, you should give them iron. Probably, right? Um, so for IV iron, 2.4 milligram per kilogram will get you a hemoglobin um, of one, up by one. And there's a lot of math involved in it, which, you know, some people really like it, so you can read, you can go through it all. Um, but 2.5 uh, meg per kg of, of, of IV iron. Um, there is a, a, an issue in that uh, IV iron is not uh, FDA approved for iron deficiency. It's, a, it's approved for uh, renal insufficiency associated with uh, iron deficiency. Um, so, but it's cheap. Um, you can give it multiple different ways. Um, typically, uh, adults get it as a, a 200 milligram uh, uh, push. Um, I'm the only one that gives uh, IV iron outpatient, and then inpatient they can get uh, IV iron. And I typically pick uh, four, um, four mg per kg, so get them up two grams um, intravenous and then continue it with oral. Um, this is also a common thing I do for the, the toddlers because if they're exclusively milk fed, they're probably not uh, have firm parents. So, so getting them to take their oral iron ain't easy. But if your hemoglobin is better, you'll feel better and you're a little more compliant. All right. And then the, the CME committee says, well, you know, we should talk about religious uh, things as well. So alternatives to transfusion. Well, I already mentioned iron, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses and others may refuse uh, blood um, for religious or um, other uh, reasons. The one the, for an operation that may need a transfusion, the best scenario is actually preoperative iron and erythropoietin. And I, uh, 
is stimulating it. Post-operative, it's not shown to be as effective. You can do this for many other patients too. You know, if you're work, you know, you know that they have, right? It's a woman you're doing a, you're planning on doing a, a hysterectomy because they have chronic uterine bleeding, right, from uh, fibroids. Okay, well, preoperative iron, maybe EPO is a good idea. Um, additionally, you can, oops, you can during the uh, operation, you can give them a lot of fluids so that what they're bleeding is mostly water, not mostly blood. Interoperatively, cell saver is uh, accepted by most uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, then you can do special techniques to try to, try to have it as bloodless as possible. Um, you can administer antiplasmins to try and limit the amount of uh, bleeding that they have. The, in, in surgery, the, the most popular one is tranexamic acid, um, which was interesting because it was um, out of favor for 40 years. Um, and immunocoproic acid um, in the uh, outpatient setting to, to limit uh, bleeding. These are both um, small molecules that inhibit plasmins, degradation of, of, of clotting. All right, so what are, what's the net result of this? Choose wisely. So transfuse patients with red cells that are bleeding or that are unstable. Right? Not hemoglobin number attached, right? Transfuse one at a time. Also, cross match one at a time. It saves work. Right? In a crisis, use O positive for, for, for adult males. Plasma and platelets have antibodies. So they, AB is the universal donor. Probably 10 mil per kg is we're gonna, what you're going to give to get you up two and a half grams. And for an adult, 150, 200 mils an hour. And for kids, five mil per kg. And then give iron for strong blood. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. O negative or A positive boost respectively bias respectively test. Is that something you mentioned? Well, so should there be a difference between transfusing a compatible platelet and an incompatible platelet for how much your platelets will rise? No. Right? Because the compatibility is on the red cell. Right? So you might have more hemolysis within with the you will have there's a possibility of hemolysis with an incompatible platelet. So you didn't actually discuss Yeah. Yes. I, I just think when you said that when you see you took um platelets out of versus plasma for body No before it's frozen, fresh plasma. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's still they still do that. They still do. Yes, yes. So when you get plasma, it has no platelets in it. Okay. So the, um, you centrifuge once, take off the pla take off the plasma plus platelets. You centrifuge again at a higher speed, right? Get a pellet of platelets squeeze off the plasma, and now you have two bags, a plasma bag that has very few platelets, and a platelet bag that has quite a bit of plasma. The, pl the plasma bag then gets frozen. The platelet bag is now available for about seven days. And all of those products have white cells. Yes. How it, although I don't know where the re leukoreduction reduction, if they, you leuco reduce the entire unit, then now you're leuco reduced. Otherwise, it would re look reduce after the fact. But I'm thinking they actually re look reduce the entire whole blood unit. It's not done here, so I don't know. All right, thanks again.